So as a scientist, you're obviously interested in everything. I don't know if any of you are, are, are scientists in the audience, but it's so hard to focus on something, right? Because everything's interesting. You, you walk around and you look at the trees and the animals and, and everything. It, it's all interesting. So when I started um, being a scientist, uh, when I came out of college, I was like, well, I'll try something you know, easy first, just to kind of get my feet wet. So I thought I'd try to figure out the human brain. <laughs> and I, I thought, you know, everyone has one. It's kind of cool, but it can't be that hard, right? The human brain is the most complex machine in the known universe. It has a billion cells and a trillion connections. It does stuff that is just, I know everyone takes these things for granted, right? But if you're sitting there looking at me and being bored and thinking about what you're <laughs> going to do on the weekend or what you did or what somebody <coughs> said or that whole awareness, that imagination, the reasoning, those, those complex higher order cognitive abilities is only in the human brain. So trying to figure out how it goes wrong and everything else, that's, that's a whole other thing, right? We don't even know how it works yet. So that is, it, it really drew me. And I thought this was really amazing. If I can start figuring out some of the things that are going on, it would be quite amazing. So I've been doing that now for the past 20 or so years, working in the, in the biotech company and then getting PhD and, and working in labs, um, trying to figure this out, right? This is quite amazing. So unfortunately, with something that is so amazing and cool and whatever else, it is fragile as well. The human brain, since we split from chimpanzees, which is about five to six million years ago in evolution, which is very short, very short window in evolution, our brain has tripled in size, right? That is incredible. As far as evolution goes, that is incredible. And it's not just tripled in general. It hasn't just blown up like a balloon. It's been regions and parts of it that have grown more than others. Other parts have stayed the same. Other parts have gotten bigger. Some of the parts that have gotten bigger have given us these abilities, right? The, part, the front part of your brain, that's where all the reasoning and awareness and all that happens, and that's just expanded tremendously in the last few million years. But it's also in these regions when you start getting problems, all right? All the way through life, even from early childhood, you can have childhood epilepsy and, and those types of, types of diseases. That's my son. He doesn't have epilepsy, but he's cute, so I put him up. <laughs> Adolescence, at the time of your life when you're supposed to be the strongest and going out and doing all these things, you have diseases like schizophrenia and bipolar, depression that just completely stop you in your tracks. Why would that be happening when this is the time when you're supposed to be your strongest? And obviously there's a lot of other diseases, dementia, neurodegeneration that happen as, as you age. So how does that happen? Why does that happen? These are very important questions and very interesting questions. When I started in brain research, these were all interesting questions. People were asking these, but we had a few problems at that point in time. Now I've told you that it's just the human brain that has expanded tremendously in certain regions, and it's only in the humans where you see those particular changes. Other animals have developed differently and evolved differently. Right? So the problem, the first one we had, was to find a suitable human model. So a lot of times scientists use other models like mice and flies and frogs, which there have been tremendous discoveries. But to try to figure out a human brain from a mouse, it's probably not going to work. People don't want you messing with their brains while they're alive, as you know. So, <laughs> so you, you could only get postmortem tissue a lot of times, and that can only tell you a certain amount. I mean, it can give you some information, but not the, the dynamic functionality of the human brain. So that was our first problem. Our second problem was our DNA and looking at all of it. And as you heard from Andrew earlier, the, the sequencing technologies now that we have in this building and around the world are tremendous. Now you can look at all the parts of a genome, 3.2 billion building blocks that make up your DNA that can stretch out to two meters, as Sue said, right? So we can start looking at all these parts of our genome. Now our genome is twice the size of a lot of other genomes. And it's evolved specifically. Our genome has evolved bigger and bigger and bigger with all these different parts of, the, of coming in and, and being part of that building block. But now we can look at all of it. Historically, we've only been looking at about 1%, which are called proteins. 
And that's what we've been looking at because that was the only thing we could do at the time, right? Technology only allowed that small window of which we found a tremendous amount of things for that 1%, but 99% of it was non-protein. This was the junk DNA stuff that people talked about for a long time. But if you think about that, 99% of what makes you you is used to be considered junk. Now that, in today's terms, we think about that like, well, that was crazy. But that was like 10 years ago, right? So, so things are moving very, very quickly. And now we're starting to look at all of the 100% of the genome and try to see, well, how does this impact on, on all the questions that we have? no matter what disease or developmental stage you're looking at. All right, human stem cells. Everybody knows what a stem cell is, I'm guessing. It's a cell that can go and turn into lots of other different types of cells. And historically, there weren't very many ways of getting stem cells and working on stem cells. And there some were, were a bit more dubious than others, right? But there's a technology now called induced pluripotent stem cells, which won the Nobel Prize a couple of years ago where from both healthy individuals and patients, from anyone basically, you can take a skin cell and reprogram it into a stem cell. And then you can take that stem cell and turn it into all different types of, of cells in the body, which is tremendous. I mean, that is an incredible technology. Now we can do this in humans, right? So what we do with that is we take these stem cells, these iPS cells as they're called, and we can turn them into any type of cell. And this is an example from Alzheimer's disease where you can make particular brain cells that are Im impacted in, in Alzheimer's disease. You can take those skin cells from people that have that disease and people that don't have the disease. Make these cells that are relevant in the human brain and you can look at them and they're functional and you can do things to them and you can watch how they, how they react. And you can see the differences of a brain cell from a, from a disease patient and from a normal, say, what is different here? And that, then we start actually understanding cell functionality. So that was the first technology that we use. And the second one, like I said, the genome sequencing, where we can now look at everything. So now you can take that human model, those <coughs> human stem cells, and make them into human brain cells or heart cells or muscle cells, whatever you want. And then we can use the sequencing and look at everything in there because a lot of what makes us human, what makes our genome different from a chimpanzee or, or any other species, is most of it is in that, in that part of the genome that we never used to look at. All right. So I'm quite excited about this. This is the first time I've actually presented this. But <laughs> I've been using these models, the sequencing and the iPS cells, and looking in the human brain to figure out what's different between a schizophrenia patient and a control patient. That. Fire. Now, why is fire interesting? Well, as humans, since we split from the chimpanzee, about two million years ago, there was a split in the human lineage between Homo habilis and Homo erectus. At that point in time, we discovered fire. Now, why is this cool? I didn't think it was cool at the time. I found all these things change in the schizophrenia neurons and the, and the normal neurons, and they were boring. They were all to do with metabolism. I'm like, this is, uh, as, a, as a neuroscientist, that's the last thing you want to see, right? <laughs> Not that interesting. But you look at what the biology told me. In the human brain, when we switched from using, well, to using fire, and taking our, our plants and, and everything that we ate and cooking them, it changed the nutrition that we gave to our bodies. So it went from being very low calorie stuff, of eating all the plants and most of it going through your system and not being digested properly, to being condensed from cooking and you only get out the nutrients. So now you're eating very, very nutrient rich food and putting that into your body. Our body completely changed at that time. If you look at the skulls between the early man and, and more modern man, our jaws got smaller, our heads got bigger, our teeth changed because you didn't have to chew as much. The rest of our body got smaller. Skeletal muscle and everything got smaller. We got more fat deposits because it's high energy storage. The whole body changed. You basically looked like a little Martian with a big head and a little body. <laughs> but that was actually true. This is only one and a half, two million years ago. It changed the brain completely. The brain got bigger. It got more metabolic, metabolically active. 
our body redistributed metabolism to the brain and it gave us so much more energy in the brain that we've used in those new areas to do new things that we use now as higher cognitive abilities. And it's in these regions and in those processes when things go wrong, we're starting to find problems in psychiatric disease. So diseases that are very human specific come from very human specific parts of the brain and we're the only species that uses fire and also does a lot of other manipulation with our food. So I thought that was tremendous, right? So we've used all these new technologies that we have, all the sequencing and the iPS cells, and we've got results, and the results may not have been what I thought they were going to be, but have opened up this incredible new avenue of being able to understand human evolution, human brain evolution, and therefore what might be going wrong in our brain. Really, it's only when we understand the inner workings of a machine <coughs> that we can actually go and fix it. It's like a mechanic. Your, your car breaks down, he comes and he goes, well, that's wrong, pulls it apart, puts in something new, off you go again. For us to do that in the brain, we're going to have to understand the brain. All the new technologies, that works that we, work that we're doing here at the Garvin and the technologies that we have here in the Garvin are opening up these incredible new avenues of understanding of us being able to actually understand what's going on in the brain and then hopefully be able to fix it. So I'll leave that there. Thanks.